bear in mind when well, something we haven't spoken about the first gods of the indo-europeans were almost certainly spirits they were not personified where the gods because the indo-europeans were hunter gatherers they they just walked around in small groups a, a personification of a god wasn't necessary but the neolithic farmers who built up communities they saw people all the time it's all about people and the gods became people they became personified Good evening, John. How are we doing? Good evening, Simon. I'm doing very well. Pleasure to talk to you again. Uh, are you ready for part two of the tree? Um, indeed. Ready for all parts of the tree, but part two is my favourite. Part two, uh, Well, all parts of the tree. Do you, do you want to go into uh, East Asian <laughs> shamanism? Not tonight, um, but uh, soon, yes. So last uh, time we spoke, we were looking at the Neolithic and the Paleolithic part of the tree. So we were very mm -hmm. much into the deep history. Uh, very much an unknown area we, we you know we, we're sort of grasping at ideas of fertility worship and the possibility of what was it in, in the aboriginal australians where we were talking about how they they believe they were descended from the spirits of animals and so on mm -hmm. so this yes. idea with the lion man we're just playing around with ideas you know what, exactly, what exactly. Well, when did human consciousness realize humans weren't animals and the things yeah. that happened from that and also have a, have a actually i do if it's okay uh, i have a slight apology to make or correction autumn so i talked about the very earliest religious um, or, or ritual we know of being in a cave uh, mm. and, and i talked about bone lengths it isn't bone lengths it's That's stalagmite right. lengths yes i thought to myself i'm sure it's stalagmite yeah. but i didn't say anything because i was like because this is your master yeah. subject area but that's yeah. great that you were able to pick up on that brilliant yes Very yes good. so when i, I watch it back yes so i just want to apologize to anybody there so it's bone lengths down, uh, down no sorry it was stalagmite lengths not bone lengths um yeah so, yeah okay brilliant so then we also then moved up from the Paleolithic era into the Neolithic and mm -hmm. we just explored the megalithic culture and again still the presence of figurines. Mm -hmm. uh, so today we're going to work on your specialist subject, Indo-European culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to spend a bit of time here today because this is your specialist subject and it, I, I, I know a lot about it from studying Norse, Slavic and Greek mythology, but I don't know it the way you know it, which is on obviously on a historical, archaeological mm -hmm. level. Okay. So it will be amazing to to dig into that today. Okay. So I've uh, written down here that it kind of emerged in an agricultural area, four thousand five hundred BCE. Right, is that around about right? Would you say so that's slightly uh, later than I put it so most people think the proto-indo-european language was being spoken 4500 bce okay. but to me i would have thought for probably a thousand years before that that language was probably developing and the culture and beliefs was happening so i actually tend to say it's probably nearer 6000 bce these things are starting to happen and that would tie in with influence from the Neolithic farmers who are coming from the Near East. So they tended to hit the Black Sea region about five and a half thousand BCE. So a thousand years before that time. And it's them coming up and clashing with the hunter gatherer societies at the time that forms what would become the proto Indo European speaking peoples and, and the cultures that come from that. So that's pre Yamnaya. What, uh, I mean, how will we ever know? But what do you think the hunter gatherer culture would have, how would they have reacted when they met with the Indo European agriculturalists? Would they have been like blown away? Like, what is this you've got here? What are these rakes and, and plows and cows you're using? They must, it must surely have been quite amazing for them to witness that. Well, we, we, yeah. So we get, we get some more evidence of that. Not the Black Sea, but in Europe. So because it took the Neolithic farmers a lot longer to go into Europe and hunter-gatherers were there initially. And so the hunter-gatherers were just ignoring the farmers first off. Hmm. Yeah, they, they were just living around them and they were slowly getting squashed, but not significantly. Um, but the big problem came when the Indo-Europeans came along and they sort of took over everything. 
and pushed everybody back. And you and that's where you start seeing cultures pushed back to the west side of Europe and eventually crossing into Britain. You get a surge of, of migration and pushing up into um, Scandinavia as well and down into Spain. And so you'll fe- see these sort of sim- well, sort of recognisable cultures, but they are different. So you get like the Basque region in Spain, which kept its Neolithic roots. You've got the Scandinavian culture, which has some very Neolithic farming roots in there and, and links to the Sami. And then you get sort of the, some of the later um, megaliths being built in Britain. And that's all because everybody's being pushed from mainland to Europe. Okay. Okay. So what was inspiring this new culture because usually when a culture emerges that we're looking at buildings and we're looking at um, uh, religious culture and we're looking at uh, warrior culture what defined the Indo-Europeans when they first emerged and why were they different to other agriculturalists okay so so the language they spoke was the key difference we work on as well as you know there's some dna differences in that the, the initial proto-indo-europeans were very different to the neolithic farmers in terms of uh, dna makeup but uh, and, and we can only assume uh, what was going on no doubt they they tried agricultural farming uh, but there's i would say from the understanding we have from the latest dna studies neolithic farming only made up you know a small fraction of the current dna we know of of those indo europeans that left the black sea so maybe five ten percent which suggests a very minimal influence but influence nonetheless so i don't think the the farming made it a, a significant impact i believe the hunter gatherers must have had a way uh, and and that makes sense because we have mythology and stories that main are maintained from pre Indo-European times that, that seep into the Indo-European culture and then are passed on into Europe. So to me, I think this this culture they had, which was very, I would say, male-dominated, and so um, it was very hierarchical as well in, in, in terms of that. So we, we see sort of family units sort of break up and, and split up and, and, and go further as, as part of their culture, which is very different to the Neolithic farmers who were very family orientated. Mm. And I think that and the fact that they they liked pastoral farming rather than agricultural farming. So they thought just keeping cows and, and maybe goats was the way to go rather than having to worry about a field of crops. That's far too much hard work for them. They'd okay. rather just graze a few cows. So, okay, let me, let me just paint this picture then. So the Indo-European culture was one of the first cultures that became patriarchal yes. which today well, that's yeah. i mean when people say patriarchal today that's obviously got a very a, emotional tone to it isn't it but this is yes, just that's uh, why i was trying to just, avoid the term <laughs> yes, really. yeah. yeah but we but it's 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 reality isn't it, it these is were very is. male it was a very male dominated it culture was. wasn't it and I like the fact as well that the other, <laughs> the other culture, agriculturists were all like plants. You know, I, I'm I'm plant based, so they're all uh, they're all having our plants and making our crops and having our wheat and barley. And these other guys come along, they're like, meat, meat, yeah. do away with all this vegetables, meat, power, man, power. And I mean, the muscles they must have had because when you've got a high protein diet and you're uh, you're riding horses and you're you're learning war craft i mean are, are they warriors is this one of the first cultures that are so, well no there are others, but you've you raised a very good point there and and it's worth noting that we see a distinct reduction in the size of humans when neolithic farming starts for those neolithic mm. farmers so i.e they're not getting the same quality of nutrients they were getting when they were hunter gatherers as farmers and so they reduce in size but the proto indo-european speaking peoples they're eating their meat and they're they're a lot bigger so where people hear stories about giants and things like that I, I, people often say oh perhaps that's a story about the the neanderthals and how we sort of merged them because they were bigger and i say well actually it's probably more to do with the you know pastoral farmers versus you know, the, the hunter gatherers or even the agricultural farmers, because there would have been a significant size difference mm. between those. So, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. But, you know, the pastoral farmers doesn't mean they weren't eating grasses and vegetables. It means they just weren't making that a primary part of their lives. Yes. 
yeah. And they, they, they were still eating the grains, but it, you know, they, they were using every part of the cow. And we, so we know all these for a number of reasons. One, from how we can reconstruct the language of the Indo-Europeans. Um, the Indo-Europeans spread out from the Black Sea. We have DNA evidence of this. Uh, but we also have linguistic evidence of, of many languages from Europe and into, across into India through Persia and the like that we can, all, all very similarly linked, uh, etymologically connected, uh, and we can trace them all back to this single source. Um, so so we, we've got real good evidence that that's where they started and that's how they spread. And as they spread, they took their stories with them. And we, we know that they're is some agricultural influence there, not only through the, the, the part of the DNA they have, as I say, from the earliest Proto-Indo-European speaking peoples we've identified, but also the stories they take and, and leave. So that's as the Scandinavian creation myth, the, the, the Viking myth of the uh, Volospor, and it talks about a thumbla, the cow, having rivers of milk from its udders. That is a very Neolithic farming motif. Um, mm. where in India the cow is used to create other animals, which is a very pastoral farming um, motif. So we, we can see, yeah, evidence of, of they're acknowledging agricultural farming. They're just not doing it as much as the agricultural farmers. Is it also present in the uh, the Norse myth with the, the Vanir and the Aesir? Is that that sense of agriculturalists versus this more... And that, well, that is a theory. Um, I've, I've, I've actually released a video about that a, a few weeks ago, basically saying, because um, you get this in, in India as well and, and in Greece with the Titans and, and yeah. the Olympians, uh, but it just seems like every good Indo-European culture has a, you know, a war story between two major cultures yeah, and, and these two things but actually more it seems more likely that that story is about um peace and making up and what to do after conflict as opposed to the conflict itself because you won't actually hear much about the stories of war but you hear a lot about the stories of peace and how they overcome mm. that what about the just the, just that sense of the when you study the uh the, the vanir they are nature based. They use nature magic. They, they yep. seem to be more peace definitely loving. the agricultural gods. Almost certainly are left over some Neolithic farming influence. Absolutely, yeah. I may see that, and, and I talk of uh, Baldur's the drummer or Baldur's dream, where he, he gets killed and he goes to hell, and people have to cry for him. That is agricultural god 101 type mythology. There. All right, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so even though there is a god of agriculture sort of considered in the viking pantheon balder is actually an agricultural god you know a god a god of summer the sun or there or seems to be harvest. lots of lots of old gods i mean like Tyr, the the sky god who uh, he just seems to be when i whenever i read the norse myths he just seems to be a supporting character but i get the sense he had a bigger role because he's linked to zeus isn't he with it on a, on a uh so on, only in terms of the name yeah. linguistically but again so we have to remember that the name Dias and, and Zeus and Tyr, which are and all linked, all cognate meaning, in effect, God, or, or you know, linked to the Sky Father. And so that's why people think, oh, we, that's an Indo-European word or Proto-Indo-European sort of root. They must have come from the Proto-Indo-Europeans. And, and most, but not necessarily, because that name's also just a title. And we see titles. So we have uh, Freya in the Viking world. And that means Lord. Mm. His actual name was Ingvi. So it's in English there, and we see that in, in the, the uh, Germanic uh, documentation we, ha we have. So it could be just, again, through poetic simplification, Tyr's name has just been reduced to Tyr. Well, I'm going to throw this that. out there. I, 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 you know, I like to throw my theories mm -hmm. out. What about the idea that the sky god we see, you know, the Zeus, they all link to the Indo-Europeans and, and possibly earlier. What if the agricultural version of Zeus was Tyr? And then when the Germanic line eventually sort of took over and dominated the agricultural culture of that time, they then had these two stories. And they were like, how is it we've got like, we've got our, our Thor character here, who's our thunder sky god. And then oh, you've got your tear, you've got your tear. Mm -hmm. He just seems to, there seems to be this echo almost, but they, they've separated them and he becomes, they just make him a background character. Again, well, I'm just checking theories out. Tear's more of a king figure, I, I, I'd say. He was, he was a, a god of justice 
um, righteousness. Um, but Zeus was around before the Indo-Europeans. So we have evidence that Zeus oh. was called at some point Zeus Perkinus. And right. Perkinus is the name of the storm god, the storm god in the Indo-Europeans. And the storm gods yeah. tended to become sky gods. Isn't that a Baltic Perk term as well? um, The Perkinus is, yes, Slavic and Baltic. They're various flavors of that. So if Zeus is already chief god and he gets Perkinus, uh, and then Perkinus actually comes the name of his lightning bolt. So if Zeus, Zeus becomes that, then Zeus is already there mm. as a chief god figure and is there being called Zeus. So that sort of, to me, argues a, a little against that approach. So to me, it's the storm god is, is well, becomes the sky god and the chief god. Yeah, I, I, we don't know for sure, but to me, the, the sky god's there from very early Indo-European influence because yeah. I don't see such a... You get storm gods who are important in Neolithic farming, uh, but they're not always chief gods. Normally it's more the Earth Mother, the Demeters or the Kybeles, mm -hmm. you know, those kind of gods who, who are powerful. And and you see that. So um, we clearly see that uh, again in Greece, where we see the Earth Mother take a secondary role in the pantheon even in the olympians who's not treated the same way as the indo-european gods from their pantheon okay this tree gives you an idea of timelines and mm -hmm. i like the idea that the indo-european cultures when they spread out because you were mentioning earlier that some took a northward direction around the black sea some took a southward direction and then a westward direction is that right or was it yeah so yeah well so some yeah some some went west straight into europe into yeah. Germany, in effect, where Germany would be in that way, like uh, and some went now. and went so south. Awesome. Obviously, some went south because they went to Anatolia and, and Greece that way, and some went east. Yeah, and some went far east into Siberia initially, yeah, uh, and some went and some went southeast to go into Persia and India. Yes, we got there. So, what fascinates me is is say now you get an old agricultural myth down mm -hmm. here, and it was just their myths may have been established, you know, five thousand years earlier. Uh, and it's connected to, if I just go down here, this part of the branch, you know, somewhere around about here. So when the agricultural myths take off, they continue. Yes, they're in here in Europe, but they continue in the sort of Black Sea region you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And then they come back round or around the Black Sea. And then these these uh, and look, look at the age difference, 4500 BCE. And then you start getting Germanic polytheism and you get the um, Mycenaean polytheism. Mm -hmm it's like they, they 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 cultures come back on each other but they've been thousands of years apart so there must be this weird sense of they they can see their myths are similar but have evolved differently and separated and, and yes, taken yes, their own directions and is is that is that a part of the myth making process that as certain poets come against an older culture that they dominate and take over they sort of want to merge together and they say well let's have a look at your myths and yeah we'll, we'll turn your gods into secondary characters and we'll make them background characters but we've got we've got our odins and our zeuses and so oh on. you you sort of see that yeah and you definitely see gods take roles of demigods or and and the like and you see that in all sorts from the bible to to greece you know. but yes there, there were multiple layers as i say five about six and a half thousand years ago neolithic farmers were coming to greece and heading up to the black sea Five and a half thousand years ago, the Indo-Europeans were, were, were starting to develop. And yeah, as you say, 2,000 years later, they're migrating back down towards Greece and into Europe. Um, but and, and what makes them powerful is that because they are patriarchal, they go into Europe just as men. They don't take their families with them. There are no families. They're just single warrior men. And they take over everything in their path you know they, they breed with the women of the neolithic farmers they breed with the women of the hunter gatherers and so these indo-europeans immediately diversify in, you know, in terms of genetics what, and, and also I'm, certainly I'm, in terms of myth i've got to check into this this is fascinating what what's going on in this culture that they're sending off single men are they are they saying right you're of age off you go go on an adventure find a woman Make, take land for yourself and settle down and create a farm. Is that, sort what's, what's of, it's, to do, it's to do with how um, hierarchy happens. So, so what you find is when the father dies, the eldest son takes the father's land. Okay, uh, but what happens to the, his brothers? Well, his brothers can't stay there because it's now the eldest son's land. So the brothers are told to go elsewhere, and they they form 
things. So, so one of the terms she uses is the manabund, uh, like a group of male warriors or wolf warriors. Uh, but we do have some evidence that you know there were these male bands of Indo-Europeans going around, causing all sorts of havoc and and, and learning how to fight. And it's probably those that entered Europe. Mm. So that's why that happened. So not only did ma males Indo-Europeans enter Europe, they tended to they were probably certainly a a group of men. You know, and that that's possibly one of the first times you really see a you know a, an army is how we perceive them today. And it's a very effective migration technique. Mm. You know, you you send your family somewhere else and they start and breed and but uh, you know, that's that's how some of the, the greatest empire builders in the world came to be that, you know, like Genghis Khan, that, that's exactly what he did. Okay. So okay, so so if you want me to summarize everything we, we sort of said is that we, we've done the Neolithic part last time we spoke. Then Indo-Europeans came in. It was almost like a lightweight introduction into Europe. It, but then there was almost like a second wave of Indo-Europeans coming. And they established the things we see now. Certainly in, in the Central Europe and Greece and the like. However, the first European Indo-Europeans that came in, they actually ended up in Scandinavia and in Siberia, as I say. And we know this because they spoke a slightly different dialect of Indo-European, Proto-Indo-European. So could you imagine if there's a thousand or two thousand years difference, language changes a bit. And we yeah, actually yeah. noticed this, and it's called the Kentum Satum split. And we see the Kentum split go to Scandinavia and Siberia. And we also know this because their flavours of story, particularly around the ferryman of the dead, and this is um, documented by Bruce Lincoln in his book, Death, War and Sacrifice, I believe. Yeah. Um, the version of the ferryman story goes to Siberia and to Scandinavia as the story we sort of tend to know that when you die, you go off to the underworld. But what happens in the Satan split is that by then, the Indo-Europeans are, are quite affected by the Persians. So in the, the, there are sort of Indo-Iranians now, which are a subgroup of the Indo-Europeans. We'll and, the the like and they introduce the uh, concept of um, judgment at death. And so the ferryman goes from just being a journey over the river Styx to the underworld to other things starting to happen. And that flavour of story we then see spread out into the, the Satan split of Indo-European languages. So we have a really good markers of, actually, there was two sort of expansions. The first expansion took some early mythology and the language, and the second expansion then, you know, really settled in places like Greece and Rome and the Slavic cultures and then the Baltic region, hmm. as well it's, as Indo-Iranians. It sounds like what your job is so complicated because, like I said, you've got maybe agricultural mm -hmm. myths that originated, say, five thousand years before the Indo-Europeans came along, and and they already have intact myths that the Indo-Europeans then have themselves, but change and adopt. Just, and just like, yeah, exactly. And then then they they come against each other and and merge, and then you're trying to separate them, and then these new little myths appear, as you just said now with the the one with Chiron, and then you, you, they set off a little ripple and start interacting, and you're trying to you're trying to build all this together and find out right, this seems to be a layer on that. If I just clean, I remember you talked to me about Odin, how complicated he is because he seems to be so. seems to be so many layers to to him. That's it. We see that, and that, that's that. That's part of my job and my research is to if i can understand the original mythology of the indo-europeans and we've got a vague idea of the original mythology of the neolithic farmers then i can take one from the other and what's left over are either the new myths or we have a better idea of what is an indo-european or neolithic myth from where we aren't quite sure yet or we can see how it's grown and that's what really happens and we get that in the creation myth so mm. we can clearly see the creation myth migrated from um, Mesopotamia uh, through into the Near East, uh, through Cyprus and Anatolia, like the Phoenicians, and into Greece, and then Rome. And we see this creation myth go there. And that creation myth is different enough to the Indo-European creation myth to show that difference. So where we see motifs that we see in the this Near Eastern creation myth appear in Indo-European areas, we can tell, ah, oh, there's been Neolithic farming influence there that persisted. Mm. But where that isn't there, we can see how oh, the Indo-Europeans completely took over that culture. Okay. 
So let's apply that to the tree. I want to check a few things out here. Bear with me. So this is where it gets really interesting with the Indo-European branch, because as you said, they've got the wheel. We met, we, did we mention this? They have the wheel. They have to, and that's helped pastoral farming. So when they were farming their cows, which they preferred, they had to farm them within a couple of miles of their home. Hmm. As soon as they got made the wheel, and not only did they make the wheel, um, they actually used the wheel on a cart, because the wheel was invented long before that, but used it like a potter's wheel. But no one decided to place it vertically. <laughs> they had this wheel horizontally and not doing much, apart from spinning clay. So, uh, yeah, when, as soon as they put it vertically and put it on a cart, then they could farm miles and miles away from their home. Mm. And that is what made them very powerful and expanded very quickly. And, and then you see this on the tree because you suddenly see that they start to move upwards, uh, as, I, as you said, across the northward, across the Black Sea into Europe. But they're also going southward and they go into mm -hmm. the Indo-Uranian culture. I, I believe, I'll, I'll keep digging into this, so I'm pretty confident they, they go, go to the, Siberia. As I say, yeah. we, we do have definite, um, there's, there's a small grouping of them over in Siberia, so, so yeah. north of China. Yeah. And then they make their way to uh, India. In, the India. And, and, well, and Persia, potentially... Yeah. Have you got any compelling evidence to say they made it any further into possibly East Asia? Did I maybe you mentioned? Uh, there is influence there, so we know that the uh, mythology around Pangu, you could argue, is of has Indo-European influence in it. I, I would agree. I would definitely say so. Definitely, you you can see Umir and you can see um, the twin uh, and the, the Manu. And, yeah. yeah, and who's who's the one from um, India? Um, who's that? Oh, oh. Uh, and there's also I found one in I found one in Vietnam. Okay, he's very similar to Pangu. He's 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 just a the name change I believe, mm. but I've, I found another version of him. Um, uh, but I still I'm still we, I'm debating this with you how this worked. But I I've still found a Pangu like character in Mesoamerica. Um, which is way over here. Mm. I still, I still haven't, I haven't, I can't. And it may it. be there, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean it migrated. I mean, there is, and and this is quite interesting for all those Jungian theorists and and Campbell lovers. Uh, whilst there is no doubt some archetypical thinking, we have this collective unconsciousness of thinking about particular things of particular way. Part of my job is to show that. A lot of these myths are the same, certainly in, in the European terms, because they came from this same source, not because everybody thought the myths up separately and they all happen to be the same. But I, I totally are. agree with you. Yeah, I totally but, agree. With you. And so that, that, but what, you know, and what you can then argue is that those cultures have their own nuances. And when you look at those nuances, they're different enough to mean that the myths have changed significantly. So you can say there's cultural influence and it also takes it away from the very, I would say almost formal narrative that Campbell has on his hero's journey. Um, so he doesn't talk about collective heroism and you, you see that a lot, or, you know, Thor at the you know, end of his journey, he has Ragnarok and he dies. <laughs> you know, there's no glory for him. You know, no, no, no finding his, his purpose in life sort of thing. Although you could argue kill him, the Midgar Serpent is is that, but you know, I'd, I'd argue it it's, isn't. It's a tra I mean, the hero's journey can end in tragedy. I mean, the hero's end it can, but the, the death is a common part towards the end, isn't it? There's a there's a usually a death, a death of someone, but not yeah. necessarily the hero. You know, because that, or, or, that really the cuts the story fact. short. Yes, exactly. You have got this collective thing that the hero's journey doesn't apply to very well. So, but it, I'm not. But what we have to do is take away that and then see what stories are left over, and then see actually are they created from this archetypal consideration mm. yeah and, and it may be that we have that in america with some primordial beings or deities that look very similar to those we have in eurasia i think some people find the Jungian argument is woo woo because the idea that this 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 ether of mind and then you can have a thought and it transfers through the ether mm. to another culture across the atlantic ocean or the pacific ocean and then they suddenly pick up on it and i i, I don't buy that at all and and I, as soon as i came across the theory of mythical migration from the origin of the world's mythologies that's the oh, first I time I came across it I, I that just made total sense to me um i i the way i, I look at young's work and archetypes is the way you see different personality types emerging in myth mm. that also can be found in regular culture because we say neurodiversity 
as a, a modern term to express people of different ways of thinking you know people seem to be very like me very visual other people seem to be very logical other people seem to be very uh sensory based and so on so you you get these different ways of the i mean there's a gentleman i can't remember his name now daniel Tennant or something and he can see color or sorry he can hear color i believe um yeah you can see mass there's a there's a flavor of mass where you can look at numbers and, and they come yeah. out as color so it's like just a, yes. yeah it's just an example of neurodiversity, and and uh, if we get around to doing myth mushrooms and tea in the future, I, I would I would explore this with you because it fascinates mm. me. But um, I I do think that that mythology has these characters that have survived the test of time, and they 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 rep- It's a bit complicated. I'm not ready to talk about this yet, but I do believe that these archetypes that we find in mythology, they've survived the test of time. They've taken shape. And they and like like we were saying before that you get a Thor character and a Zeus character and they evolved over thousands of years but they 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 maintained they had an integrity they didn't change dramatically because they they were linked to the storm and the storm is always the storm it always has the same persona when you when you project consciousness upon it and you you believe the storm is living you're not going to think it's a nice soft gentle spirit you're always you're always going to think it's a powerful force that strikes down with might as and it's long possibly... as as long as it's associated with the storm yes yes uh, but yes. If, yes yes and as uh, if that if other cultures said oh this the, that's just the day god that's angry and sometimes it gets moody and starts to create clouds but um if you were to think of weather as a hierarchy and you've got your wind, you know, windy days and sunny days and rainy days and you just say what would be the hierarchical pinnacle Mm. of of weather you'd pretty much say the storm uh maybe somebody might say no cyclone or uh or a tornado yeah, but something but it's still a storm it's, it's the powerful yeah yeah the powerful and the noise and and the visual things it's got everything to make it feel like it's alive so when we project yeah. our consciousness upon nature uh, we, we're seeing a reflection of ourselves bouncing up oh all us, gods yeah. are a reflection of, of that i mean so yeah. environment it influences that so bear in mind when well, something we haven't spoken about, the first gods of the Indo-Europeans were almost certainly spirits. They were not personified. Mm-hmm. Where the gods, because the Indo-Europeans were hunter-gatherers, they they just walked around in small groups. A, a personification of a god wasn't necessary. But with the Neolithic farmers who built up communities, they saw people all the time. It's all about people, and the gods became people. Mm-hmm. They became personified. You could argue as well that as our minds were evolving, as our ego minds were evolving, then as we were projecting our consciousness outwards, it became like if you think of 150,000 years ago when the first myths possibly were emerging, Mm -hmm. our minds were so much simpler and so much more connected to the environment. We weren't as abstract in our way of thinking as we are now. So it was it was just a more spiritual sort of essence that we were projecting. But the the, animism—it's animism, isn't it? It's like yeah, that's it. But fast forward then to the, you know, the Bronze Age where we're moving into now, our minds, we've got civilizations, we've got uh, our languages developed, we're able to think far more abstractly than we ever thought before. And that's when the gods start to become, it's almost like as we're reflecting our consciousness outwards, our ego is making them more human-like. They've become more hu- hu- human Yes, that's very like, I mean, because the, the Indo-Europeans and almost certainly the Neolithic farmers were as in intelligent as us generally or not not significantly different to our, our thoughts and our minds and how we you know what they could comprehend wow yeah i mean they were like us yeah they, they weren't much different physically or anything yeah yeah so that fa- that's the fascinating part i find with Jungian mm. psychology I, I bring in it that way i i there's a woo-woo side you can go with and and uh, you know I'll, yeah, that's I'll the psychology it, but... Yeah, but yeah yeah, yeah. But I do, I do like the idea of the archetypes and the the projection of your consciousness and seeing. But by studying the gods, you are in effect studying human persona, human psyche, human personalities. Um, just bouncing back at us, you know, we bounce our consciousness out and we make something come alive. It's just us, and we look at. You can study psychology through it, and I think that's why Jung drew upon it and why Freud drew upon it because they were seeing uh, the shape of human consciousness as it as it was going out and bouncing back a bit it's like a light, a light projection okay so back to the tree mm-hmm. uh let me bring it back up so so yes we've got these layers we've got layers and 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 um yeah you're trying to dissect a lot of this trying to see how what influence of this made it into this culture and so Thank for you. instance um uh, let's go back to umia we're finding him this this character let's begin let's take it as far back as we can 
Umir is the Norse description of a of a giant that that is slain by Odin and his brothers, and his body is turned into the cosmos. Sort right? of. So Ymir uh, is a primordial being, and yes, he is slayed by uh, Odin and his brothers, to, and uh, that body is used to create the world. Hmm. And then you've been able to, with your fellow academics, to reconstruct an even older story. So could you just take us through that? This is this is a fundamental Indo-European myth of Manu. Exactly. So and so, and, and the reason we do this is because a very similar story exists in India. We see it in Zoroastrianism, and we see it, you know, bits in Rome and the like. So there's a lot of this story around. But the the gist of the Indo-European creation myth is that in the beginning there was Manu, Yimo, and uh, a giant cow in terms of primordial beings born from the universe and they need a home and Manu which means man uh, sacrificed Jimo which means twin and used his body to build the world and then uh, he used some of his body to build people on the world and then in some myths they use the cow to create the animals and the plants of the world and that's how the world comes to be but then what we also see is that one of the first men that then exists is called Trito, meaning three. So you have Manu, one, Yimo, twin, two, and Trito, three. And we see this, and we see this again in uh, Iranian mythology and Indian mythology. And Trito is the first warrior, the first dragon slayer. And so we see him kill the dragon uh, to get cows for people. And then there's a sacrifice. And the sacrifice is that uh, you sacrifice the cow to... Give, not only give to the gods, but to use parts of the cow to help recreate more cows. But what is also interesting is that the, there is human sacrifice going on and they kill humans and use parts of the humans to create, you know, to give to the gods so the gods can create more humans. Just in effect, consider the cow and the human a mini version of Yimo and the primordial cow. And so you have this cycle and we see this. So, yeah, we got we got lots of really good evidence and good names that are all across Indo-European culture that are the same that show this. Because people say, how do you know the myth in Scandinavia is the same as one in, is in India? But they have Manu and they have Trito and they have, you know, they, they wouldn't use the same names in the same myth if they didn't come from the same place. Amazing. So uh, Manu represents the first human Yes, and the like, priest. Like oh, so, so he became the yes. The, well, he, the, the, he became the first priest onto the, the land, and he taught people how to sacrifice. Mm. And so, it, th then that's why people. Yeah, so so people are created from say Yimo, and they they that's how they existed. And so you get kings and priests from the head, warriors from the body, and um, co top providers or farmers from the legs. And, and then the what feet, they the feet the, was it there was the feet uh, in there. India in India they have a feet as well for the the very low classes and yeah you know, there are some to, people who want to argue that there's four classes but we don't see that elsewhere it's predominantly three uh, and so what we see is that when more people and you know, if, if, if if you're suffering and people are dying and you need more people in your tribe you sacrifice a man because you can give you're giving the head to make sure there's kings and the body to make sure there's warriors and the legs to make sure there's people and people would eat them in their effort to be produced in the cows. Do we know whether those who were sacrificed did so willingly or whether they were forced to do it? Some were willing, some were forced. Okay. So that to, so to, this is the power of belief, isn't it? They sacrificed their own lives, those who were willing to do it, because they believed it would... Is this similar to, I know this sounds a bit of a jump, but in the Aboriginal uh, Australian culture, they have song lines and they have to maintain reality. They have to maintain the integrity of the land by constantly singing and remembering the songs of ancient times and continuing to sing them. And these songs are specific to, say, um, what's Ayers Rock called? I've forgotten the proper name for it, Uhuru. So they have to sing the song for Uhuru to, to maintain its integrity. And there's this, it's a, it's, a, it's a ritual, isn't it, to maintain this thing, mm. which you're saying in effect is kind of what these priests are doing. They are maintaining 
Can you can you extrapolate that? Well, yeah, said? sure. But we, well, let me explain it a bit further. So, because it isn't just about sacrifice; it's about social order as well. So, when you have multiple tribes of one culture, they're all living their own lives, all all separate. And so, what a sacrifice does is because everybody knows the creation myth and knows that the head is for kings and the body is for warriors and legs for feet. When people come together for a sacrifice, everybody's equal at that point the sacrifice happens. Everybody, there's no hierarchies, everybody's just watching one person die. When that person dies or, or that cow is sacrificed, there is a there are rituals that then will offer part of the cow or part of, or part of the victim, let's say, to various people. And dependent on when you got that piece of meat and where that piece of meat came from, that told you your hierarchy in society. And that that's really important. And so people, and that, you know, I, I would imagine it's so important that if something went wrong, another sacrifice would have to happen again to, for, to put it, it right but that and so everybody had their appropriate share and then they dispersed again but so the sacrifice wasn't about only reinforcing the creation myth and and making the world better again it was it was because we had this class system of, of kings and, and um, warriors and, and commoners it was a way of establishing that and it's a way of establishing which tribes are are the most important and we see this clearly in in Books like Tacitus's uh, Germania, where he talks about the three tribes, and one of them is, the, I think, it's the Subi, and they're uh, part of an, another tribe, uh, a large tribe of these tribes. And, and he talks about this order, and he sort of subtly hints that you know, some of the head and the rest of the chest of, of this. And, and, and yeah, you'll see other examples of this. And what is really weird about it is that if we actually take this further, when you sit down to dinner with friends and you serve the food, who do you serve first and what food do you get? And that is an effect established in a social order. In effect, you're re mm. reenacting the ritual of sacrifice and social order at a mealtime with friends. Wow. Uh, this hierarchy that we were talking about with the feasting, Mm -hmm. um it's not something we see anymore it's kind of uh i mean christmas time you could argue i guess in america they've got their thanksgiving that's the one yeah it's coming together and, the, and, the, and then serving the food first it's it's mm. still kind of there but it's a shame i just i, I feel like we're, well, you we're do have out. it but you have it in societies so the reason i know this is there's a brilliant book it's highlighted by bruce lincoln called the the society of of, of steak but it was about it was about a chap who who was a brother at one of these societies which was called the sublime society of beef steak which was in london for about 150 years mm. and it was a, an egalitarianism egalitarian type society where everybody was meant to be equal and all they did at this society was eat steak and they called everybody brother and everybody wore the same uniform and they'd meet every saturday between sort of november and june i think it was something but as this started more and, more and more people wanted to join this society and so it started off as thespians and painters. But after 100 years, you had even the King of England was a member of the society. And they didn't, and they didn't just call him Brother George IV. Oh, they were called him Brother His Royal Highness, you know, Prince of Wales, George IV. So even in this egalitarian world, they had a contradictory hierarchy in place with these titles. And you could be sure if someone came in, they would be introduced to king george before anyone else is, is that a that. An, an early communist sort of experiment there because they're sort of trying to say we're all equal and we're all to get this together oh, that happens every, that every society has that you yeah. go to pretty much any society any sort of boys club or anything like that everybody tries to be equal but it never works they, they, you will always hierarchy will always appear whether see i've got a, 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 it's another one of my theories <laughs> um communism i um I think myths, this is the power of myth. I think this is why myths are important. They they show you uh, not just stories, but they show you snapshots of culture all around the world. And they, they show you a structure. And it's very often hierarchical, isn't it? With the gods and you have the greater gods and the lesser gods. And then you've got the spirits mm -hmm. and so on. And you get the mortals. And hierarchy seems to be something that is um, almost ubiquitous to, to all these myths. Yes. 
and it seems to it just captures this essence of it's the way of things you know with nature nature's no different you take snapshots of nature and the hierarchy's there and um I do think there's wisdom in myths I think, and, and, and in nature. And I think when we're trying, to force, yes. we're trying to force it down, let's bring down the power structures and do away with the patriarchy. And it's going to end I, in I tears. Think it's going to end in tears. And I mean, I you think... don't, the weak animals don't breed for a reason. Yeah. Without being too black. Or, you know, or, or, you know, and, but luckily, we're, you know, we aren't just a physical thing. Now we're, we're mental and you know, we understand mentality a lot better that it isn't just your intelligence; it's creativity. There's all there's a number of factors in there, but it is a uh, yeah. It's still yeah. It's, it will cause problems. You can't have an egalitarian system. It just doesn't mm. work. You need hierarchy. I, I believe. And, this, I, I just, yeah, just, and Jordan Peterson just, argues for this as much as you love him yeah. or hate him. Yes, it's, yes. He's he's all over that, isn't he? He he. If anybody looks into his works, you'll find he's always referencing the Bible and myths as as the, the hierarchy and how it's it. It just shows you that socially, the social structures seem to remain more stable and intact if there's a strong hierarchy. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, even Stephen Fry was saying, you know, he's not a massive lover of royalty, but he did say that in all the countries that have a king, they seem to have the most stable societies. Mm-hmm. There's something going on there with this figurehead at the top that represents the nation. Um Hmm. On an empirical level, he said, we don't quite yes. understand why. Yeah, you can't really to be a measure thing. it, but yes, yeah, yeah. But it's, and we, we have lost a lot of that. Yes, you know, the, yeah, cl- right. the classes and things like that. We've, you know, we're, we're less of a class system than we used to be, and that's yeah, and that's probably worth getting rid of. But yeah, you still need a hierarchy. In there. It's, funny, it's, always, it's always the youth, I, myself included. I still have a youthful side to me, and I do like the idea so much of balancing things out and having hierarchical structures broken down that are too you know that have got too high up there they've lost touch with us and they so need on, a but... reason you know you can't just have hierarchy for the sake of hierarchy but everything needs hierarchy yeah so yeah. But you just got to have the right hierarchy in place for the right outcomes yeah i heard somebody today saying that some of the high that it's almost like when you go too high up the hierarchy you lose touch with the base, the, the 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 ground, and that 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 also causes a disruption and a breakdown. Just as trying to, yes. just as trying to flatten it down too much causes damage. Also, letting it go too high causes exactly because if the king only listens balance. to the warriors, hmm. then the, the, the king has lost touch with the the providers. You know, yeah, absolutely. So That's anyway, that was a, a I don't know if that was a diversion from where we're talking about, but it was explaining the creation myth and sacrifice and. The religion yeah, of and the, the hierarchy that comes from you know Umi. This, yeah. it, it, it's it's telling you a story of hierarchy. I just thought it was just uh, relevant to, to things that are going on today in our mm. crazy world. Um, so there we go. Uh, let's move up a bit now, so you can see. We'll I'll, I'll be exploring these Indo-European influences in the Vedic tradition, in the Siberian traditions, and the Mesopotamian ones later. So for now, I'd like to stick to this Europe. branch as it goes into Europe, Europe. which is again yes. your speciality. So if I zoom in a little bit. Um, well, I've got it that the Hattin Hattin. culture, yeah, quite an early one, but it's very much influenced by Indo-European and Middle Eastern, I've got there. Yeah, Germanic. anything in Anatolia, which is what we're talking yeah. about there, sort of, because that's slap between the Near East and Europe. That, the, you know, and Anatolia used to be assumed to be the start of the Indo-Europeans, but we know now that, that it's not through DNA. I've got Germanic as quite clean mm-hmm. cut from the indo-european branch with no influence from the middle east would you would you argue against that uh well yeah balder is a prime example that he is near east and he's in there so there must have been some near eastern influence in there we have the creation myth with the cow with milk in the uh, mm. sort of nordic myths so neolithic farmers were had populated europe before the indo-europeans came along so you when the indo-european yeah yeah, so when the Indo Europeans came there. along, they they say they married the Neolithic farmers' wives uh, and the hunter gatherers, and in some places where they're probably more hunter gatherers than Neolithic, they probably kept the Indo European pantheons more. In the places where there were Neolithic farmers' wives, they probably persuaded there to be some maintenance of their culture, oh, of the older gods, Interesting. Of the older gods. And as you God. say, there would have been some almost recognizable similarities there perhaps in terms of pantheons so it isn't isn't surprising that happens you know so if, if the wife of an indo-european warrior married against her will but in, in there she had this pantheon of an earth mother and a storm god and whatever and her husband had a 
sort of a, a earth mother type figure and a storm god and that you could see how they sort of would maintain and, and carry on that makes sense yeah okay i'd love i just love the the layer upon layer of myths and again this is where the archetypes come through where where there's a, a survival of the fittest you know who's whose version of the myth wins out and then they, they sort of back mm. each other in one it's strange isn't it that there does seem to be a survival of the fittest within the mythical religious world sort of the, the most interesting place is rome so rome whilst we don't have a, a a version of the myth as near complete as in in the greek of of the greek creation myth the romans did tell the greek creation myth which is a near eastern neolithic farming creation myth however also within rome we have the myth of romulus and remus which is an indo-european creation myth so you have two myths sitting side by side and they've basically forgotten the primitive meaning of the Romulus and Remus myth but so they, they have it as a myth for the creation of Rome but they didn't understand it has come from hmm. you know, the Indo-European creation so that sort of tells you that perhaps the Indo-Europeans came in established something and then the Neolithic farmers laid on top yeah yeah uh, that, you know, or, or perhaps something happened when or to take over Rome um from the Etruscans or, or whatever so yeah the, the, the trying to unpick that is it's really interesting but it is because the names in there. So, so Romulus and Remus. Rom, we can. I think it was Puvel who established a cognate, so an etymological kind of establishment between Romulus and Emir or, or Yemo. Mm. So, so Romulus came from Quirinus, which it is like, which came from like a pair of, of names, so as a twins, which is then linked to Yemo. So, yeah, there, we have that in there. So. Layers upon layers upon layers, my God. Okay, so I'm just coming down a bit. So <laughs> let's have a look at this. The Indo-European branch, it goes all over the place here. So mm-hmm. uh, let's have a quick look at the Celtic culture. Um, is it uh, yes. a, a good mix of agriculturalist pre No, it's, it's very much Indo-European. So, and we have problems here. So the problem we have is that nothing's really documented until the Christians come along. Okay, and, and they don't document things as in, a, in an unbiased way scientific fashion though they have faith and ideas that the locals weren't really keen on so you you lose some of it yeah we, we have the, the celtic cycle and the like but one of the best books we've got is the tain of which is uh, the story of driving cattle across ireland and actually in there there are some really strong indo-european motifs mm-hmm. especially at the end when the cattle is killed and spread across the land to create the landscape you know, using a cow to create the landscape. But there's other you know, the Indo-European warrior motifs within there. So whilst we don't really have any decent documentation on their early beliefs, many, you know, we, we just have to Christian things. Many of the things that come out of that, which people call Celtic, you know, tend to be really new wave paganism. Well, oh. rather than, rather than but, but, you know, things like Halloween, no one pre-Christian days celebrated Halloween purely for the fact that we didn't have the Gregorian calendar being used in Ireland to have a 30th of October. It was celebrated on a, on a moon, on a full moon, mm. which we've seen in other areas of uh, Germania and uh, Germany and other parts of, of, of the world. So it's like it's what you have is the leftovers of a paganism. I wouldn't even call it they, they, evolved, they, but they, mutated. Yes. Um, and, and that's what you've got. So, so, and what you've got to do is try to unpick that in a sensible way way and that's very challenging because of the lack of other from, documentation from places like i mean if i go back down here if we go to the uh, megalithic culture and you've got mm-hmm. uh, stonehenge and you've got newgrange and you've got the karnak stones we, we're seeing the alignment to the 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 moon and the sun and we get the sense that they, they're documenting this is midwinter, this is midsummer, this is uh, the autumn equinox. Yes, they understand the season. And they had, fest- yeah. they had festivals there. So we, the is, moons, is, yeah. do we do we know whether that their mid uh, their autumn equinox? They mm-hmm. didn't call it Halloween, obviously, but would they would it have had the flavour of Halloween? Would if we went back in time and saw them celebrating it, would we go that's Halloween? I mean, it's still. Well, it's I would say. Well, I would, I would say yes. It will be the the. Um, winter solstice would be that because it's the longest night of the year when you're closest to the dead and so new mm. grange and stonehenge all light up on that day 
you know, the sun sh shines down a passageway of a new grange or, or you know, goes under the, the, the keystone at Stonehenge. So, yeah, I mean, that that was it. And so it's moved from the middle of December or 20, 22nd of December to maybe the first moon of December. But then perhaps mm -hmm. something happened and they couldn't celebrate it, and so they moved it to the previous moon. Which was probably near Halloween, and so then why would the why did the Christians grab the the winter solstice very close Halloween, Christmas Halloween esque and then move? They just thought, oh no, we're not going to put that anywhere near our. Well, but it might, probably it could have well be that. You know, it's hard to say. You know, speculation there, but uh, that's how I would see it. I mean, although bear in mind the Christians didn't put Christmas there because of the winter solstice. That's that's purely coincidental. We have no proof of that. Um, because they were worried about when Jesus was uh, died and when Jesus was created in the womb, which was Easter. So, and mm. so the Christians thought the day you died was the same day as you were conceived. Oh, right. Okay. So with Jesus born, they, everybody knew Jesus was born around Easter, which again is a bit pagan because Easter moves according to the moon. But yeah, you know, let's not tell the Christians that too much. Um, but yeah, and so Jesus is born nine months after Easter. Okay, and that happens okay. to be near Christmas. That ma that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, um, right. Going back to the Celtic, okay. the Celtic myths. Uh, here we are, Celtic polytheism. Uh, a lot of shape shifting going on. So there's lots of things that are, I mean, I know it was written by Christian monks mm. or. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah predominantly monks, but yeah. But, but you, there's so much in there that is so uh, pagan. And it just goes counter to the Christian values. How did they get away writing it? Was it scandalous to write to write the Celtic myths down at the time? Because well, they... you don't know if what they were writing was accurate or not. So there's a really good argument about Druids and whether Druids committed human sacrifices. Because you see, it talked about in the Gemini that the that Druids were barbaric and committed human atrocities. But you see. Uh, in other documentation, the Druids were very wise and, and philosophical people, as much so as the Greeks. And, you know, so, so what story is true? And, and, and unfortunately, one of the best pieces of literature written about them is now lost. And all we've got are people who've, who've written from that piece of literature in, in Roman times. I think his name was Poseidonus, I think his name is, um, who, who wrote about it. And he talks about how Druids did human sacrifices and were very smart um that makes sense to me i mean i i that to me the way i see it is depending on the person viewing it one person will see the wisdom that then the practices their ways the how they read the moon and the stars and go there's great wisdom in these people oh and they're also chopping people's heads off and shrinking them down and hanging them off their skirts and yeah. then from another person view point of view they go my that's horrific that's barbaric <laughs> but it, there's a meaning there's a ritual to it there's i mean like i know that the in the polynesian islands when captain cook landed on the island um, where he eventually met his death, they ate him, didn't they? Mm. They ate, they ate his body, and it was to the horror of the crew. And they were like, "These are savages. These are barbarians." But we found out later they ate him because they believed that they would take in his spirit, and they had mm. deep, great respect for him. He he'd apparently committed a taboo, so they were like, "Well, this guy's got to die." But they ate him because they were like, "This this is an, this guy is so important. He's he's mm. huge in our world." But you know, we we have to eat him now. So you can see why, from one point of view. They were considered to be uh, very wise uh, people who had this ancient tradition. And again, they were star navigators and so on. But they were also, through the eyes of other people, savages. So I, I, mm. it could be the same thing. It could be They can be both, just depending on, I guess, who's looking through that. Yeah, it's really drives philosophy, yeah, to me. You know, sacrifice shows there's a thinking there on how the universe works. So, but yeah, I can't, but I have to be honest and say, I can't really talk much about this the, the celtic ways because they weren't really documented at the time it's all mm. yeah you, you can only put out bits of information but you have to assume much of it was indo-european influenced there's one story that sticks out to me when i read it and it's it reminded me it's got this uh it's an archetypal story i haven't put it together yet but i recognize it so there's a shape-shifting god and he falls in love with this woman and he wants to get with her, but Balor, the uh, he, Balor mm. has had this prophecy told to him that if his daughter gets pregnant, the child will kill him. So he's like, "Well, I'm not letting my daughter get pregnant." So he locks her in a tower. 
this shape-shifting god manages to find a way to get to the tower. Um, this witch helps him and he gets into the tower and he makes love to her and they have a child. And that child is his Lu or Luch, as okay. you say. And, and Luch uh, uh, goes on then to defeat Balor uh, eventually yeah. and, and the prophecy comes and true. And the cycle, yeah, that's right. And, and that reminds me of uh, Kronos was told that one of his children would kill him. So he ate them all. And then Zeus gets away because his mother you know, snatches him off and hides him in a cave. And eventually he comes back and he, he, lo and behold, kills his father. So I could see that Luch and Zeus, I'm not saying they're cognate with each other, but the story had a similar shape to it. The chief and then, God, yeah. yeah. And then Moses, again, you know, is in the basket. He gets taken away. He gets in the higher echelons and he ends up bringing down the Pharaoh. Does, I don't know if the Pharaoh is told by prophecy he'll be taken down. But you can see the similar shape in, in the archetypal oh, that story. Was, uh, yeah, that's Near East. Near East is, yeah, yeah beware of your sons and daughters because they will kill you. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, well, that's, that happens a lot. But, I mean, it was normally done to create a sort of divine hierarchy because a god can't just appear out of nowhere it needs a backstory so there, you found this backstory from gods having sons and daughters who killed each other to eventually allow the gods in existence to be there and he's got a divine right to be there because he's you know from great uh, lineage um, so, stock, that's right yeah yeah okay so okay the celtic one it's a bit hard to touch on as you say so we'll move yes, on to the you say we know about Luke, but yeah and we know it's there we know there's in the european influence from the text we do have but it is yeah we're really light on the ground on terms of actually what was going on in ritual and the like now i noticed that the mycenaean and the germanic polytheistic cultures they appear you know between 2000 and 1500 bce then there seems to be this, you know, Celtic. Then I've got written down as the eighth, eighth uh, century BCE. But the other Indo-European cultures that we're familiar with today, Baltic, Slavic, Norse, they come along a lot later. Why is that? I mean, have I made a mistake first of all, or is it that they actually took a long time to migrate and settle into those lands in the in the Norse periods? Again, we got we haven't the documentation there, so all we can do is base it on archaeological finds. Okay, so. Yeah, and until recently, we we thought Odin may only be maybe fifteen hundred years old, but we now think he's near at least two thousand years old. Yeah, in terms of archaeological finds, there are there is other evidence to suggest he's older, and it's the same with with these. You know, without doubt, because we know Zeus was called Zeus Perculus, you know, and Zeus was around seven eight hundred BCE, and Slavic, <laughs> the Slavic people had a storm god called Perculus then I'd imagine the Slavic polytheism was going around 8th or 9th century CE for that to happen, for them to come down into Greece to influence them. And in fact, probably, probably older than that still. In fact, you know, they, they were going along as, as long as the, you know, Germanic people and the like. So to me, most of that was probably about 2000 BCE that there was stuff going on there without a doubt. I, I totally believe you. What shall I do? Shall I move those down here with their Germanic counterparts and the and the the um, Celtic counterparts. Well, you've got that big green line. So that big green line at the bottom, which is horizontal, coming out from Minoans and and all those. You, you probably want to maybe slap something there, saying um, Indo-European polytheism or something like that. Or, yeah, or I've, got, I've, got you want to call I've got it. I've got it. I've got down and I've got. Yeah, it but down this there, is proto. Do. Well, do you're talking about proto-European polytheism. Yes. Okay, proto because okay, because it's yeah. different because the Indo-Iranian side, I say, is the Satan split, and they suddenly went to Zoroastrianism, and you got the spirituality, and you got the judgment, and that's far different to what we see in Europe. So, so okay. Europe, Europe tends to be very so patriarchal I, and old school. I thought proto indo European was a language. Is it? Okay it is. To it say? is. But, but okay. it's, it's this, the, the, the their beliefs would be passed on. Right. With that. So I'll say Proto-Indo-European polytheism. That's a right word, yeah. tongue twister there. And then Indo-European polytheism there. And then that covers us. And and I think, I mean, archaeologically, these dates seem to be the ones that seem to be sticking. Archaeologically, yes. But at least you've got, you've got something. So at least people know something's happened between yes. a date before then, up to then. And so that big green line would actually relate to the Indo-European um, migrations into Europe. And okay, so that would so. that would that would vary slightly, and we've talked about this having almost like a, a sloping net angle as people go from Eastern Europe through Central Europe and into Western Europe. That line goes from let's say 
three, well, three and a half thousand BCE, four thousand BC to two thousand BC. Hmm. But it's hard okay. to draw the line. So just draw the big thick line you've got and okay. whack it on that. Uh, Greek, right? Let's go to Greek. Greek's where it gets interesting okay. because you've been talking about this uh, recently to me. Indo-European influences versus the Middle Eastern influences. I've drawn a line here from the Middle Eastern branch. So you can see down here, Mesopotamian polytheism, 4,100 BCE. I've got Indo-European polytheism, 4,500 BC, which actually predated that. Um, but mm -hmm. did, w would you say ultimately it was the Middle Eastern culture where all this emerged from? And so therefore the Indo-European people, they would have been agriculturalists, but the bulk of the Indo-European myths would have come from the Middle East. Is that right? How do I explain this easily? Um, <laughs> Good luck. Uh, without doubt, the Neolithic farmers, uh, so the early European farmers, came to Europe first, came to Greece. Uh, and so they were in Greece, I think it was about 6,500 BCE. It took, takes about 1,000 years to get into Europe. Um, and that they have all sorts of problems. And they're about four and a half thousand years BCE, they're, they've sort of established in Europe. And then they start trading with the Indo-Europeans. So there's a, already a cultural interaction going on. Uh, but the Indo-Europeans uh, bring along with them, because they sit around animals all day, the plague, and wipe out a good chunk of the early European farmers in Europe. Uh, and that gives them the space to then move in. So you get this initial move in, and I'd imagine some of them move south into Greece and start influencing some of Greece and go to the islands. And there's a, a sort of, I guess, a light dispersal initially. Most, I'd imagine most of them stick to northern Europe and into Scandinavia and then those kind of regions, you know, and then and Denmark and northern Germany. Uh, and the early European farmers and these Indian Europeans sort of live in a calmer state as possible and then there's this uh, a sort of a second wave of indo-europeans that come later that, that put everything as we see it and so there's a sort of lost generation as you say these layers of of you know of, of myths and religion and, and culture and how to best draw that i don't know because you, you need sort of a green line and yellow line and a well a yellow line and a green line and they oh wow like, a, like i've got i mean you yellow. can see i've got two yes. splits there Exactly. And the same, you've got, you got that with Zoroastrianism. You get, um, yeah. uh, you know, that, that, that's probably more Indo European. There is Indo European influence into Zoroastrianism, without a doubt, because we see uh, remarks of people like Gehemart and Yema and, yes. um, and Creation in there. So I think that needs to be another episode. Okay. Also, because I'm running out of time. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, um, so so yeah. we, we we pretty much finished there i just got to the greek branch and i was just going to say but we can we can follow the greek branch because it's going to take us up to the where we meet christianity which uh if you're up yes. for doing a third talk which i think will be the final one of the european branch i want to study uh the the indo-european myths as we come to the the zenith of it with greek mythology and then how christianity comes along and changes the entire landscape of the the religious mythical lands of Europe. Yes, yes. And there's many different ways we can tackle that. Because some people think Christianity came from the Near East. Some think it was uh, created from the Romans. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I have got, I have got the, I mean, if you see here, I've got the Roman Christianity there and yep. it goes up into that branch. So I've clearly, you know, you've got that major uh access leading mm. outward into the rest of europe so, well, so uh, I'll, 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 yeah i don't think it's quite that clear it's a bit, yeah but we can we can talk about that and what i know about it and uh, yeah Happy well thank you that. very much john it's been a pleasure i'm i'm looking forward to hitting part three which i think will be the final part of of uh, the okay. branches at the very top just to finish as well we will be looking at the neo-pagan movements that then have started to re-emerge uh, post Christianity, not that Christianity is over, obviously, but there's a resurgence which I think is worth talking about because yeah. they're, they're all over the place as you can yeah, see them. Christians aren't allowed center. to kill pagans nowadays, so it allows those cultures to thrive. Let's make it a comeback, right? Brilliant, John. Thank you very much. That's an absolute pleasure as always. Have a fantastic week, and I will see you for the next episode of the Tree of Religion on the European yeah. branch. Take care, Take care John.
Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.